Thank you for joining us uh, for our discussion on No More Sinkholes, a case study where we review a $33 million infrastructure rehabilitation project that required critical 24-7 water level monitoring. Our featured speakers for today, Jeffrey Barrett has over a decade of experience in data management systems and applications. He's a geotechnical engineer who works with Geocon's design team to create new hardware and software solutions for Geocon's various product lines. Zachary Carr is a geotechnical engineer with FK Engineering with 24 years experience primarily in Michigan and the Midwest. He gets to spend a lot of time underground in and around Detroit exploring and expecting aging interceptors and other related facilities. Variable subsurface conditions that surround these interceptors make dewatering and related monitoring a critical aspect for a successful project, which is what we'll be highlighting today. Mike Krusey is the co-founder and CTO of Inswa Technologies. Mike's educational background is in physics and electrical engineering. Early in his career, he worked as an instrumentation engineer in the medical field, but more recently has been building cloud-based software applications. All right. Thank you, Joelle. I appreciate the, the intro and uh, I'll, I'll get us off started and kind of give a, a really brief overview of the project that uh, that this is all surrounded around, which what you guys are attending the seminar for or the webinar for. Uh, Christmas Eve 2016, um, I got a call that that morning from my boss, his first day of vacation. And he's like, hey, we got a big problem. And uh, that set off about eight months of 24 hour a day, seven day a week type work. And uh, so this was a sinkhole on an 11 foot diameter, 60 foot deep sewer in Macomb County. It is actually one of two major interceptor arms. Um, this particular arm serves about 600,000 people. Uh, the other arm serves another, I think 250, I think it's together about 800,000 people are serviced by this interceptor. 150 CFS, it's a, it's a major arm. Um, this particular reach, this was the third sinkhole since it was built in the early 1970s. The system as a whole is a fourth sinkhole on the system as a whole. So this is a, an interceptor system that has been plagued with, with a, a poor history. And uh, this was, uh, I think the most recent one before the 2016 was in 2004. Um, this particular sinkhole, you can kind of see in that bottom picture there, it was about a football field long, and this was a this was an early photo. It was continuing to grow as we got out there Christmas Eve morning. It was you know it took out this guy's circle driveway, took out an entrance to a one entrance neighborhood. We had to wake everybody up and move them out of their homes on Christmas Eve. So it was a it was a major catastrophe. It was on CNN, which you guys will see here uh, all over the news, which you'll see in a minute, and uh, we. We took out to condemn three residential homes. Two of the homes ended up having to be completely demolished. Um, a new commissioner, a new water resource commissioner for Macomb County was just taking over. Her first day on a job is going to be January 1st. And the other other commissioner was outgoing and he was on vacation. So she jumped in, you know, pulled the boots on right away. And she's like, hey, why is this going on? Why do we have this history? And it shut off a, a you know, a 20 mile. 29 miles study of the whole interceptor system, um, which led to the project that we're gonna be talking about today. So this is a continuation of that rehab that started in 2000, early 2017. I'm gonna to turn to a very different kind of security concern this morning. This one outside of Detroit, it involves a massive sinkhole that opened up there on Christmas Eve. More than a dozen homes had to be evacuated, people running out with their Christmas gifts in hand. ABC's Eva Pilgrim is on the story from Fraser, Michigan. Eva, good morning. Dan, if you look at this fence behind me, you can see that the brick home is leaning at an angle. It appears to be sliding a sinkhole, pulling it in this morning. Families anxiously waiting to see how big the sinkhole gets and what it takes next. This morning, a state of emergency in Fraser, Michigan, a sinkhole threatening this entire neighborhood. We're a small town, something big has happened. The sinkhole devouring everything above it. Authorities concerned it will grow. Homes hanging in the balance. 
So far, 22 families evacuated, including Sue Alba, who woke up early Christmas Eve to the sound of splintering brick. A lot of noises cracking throughout the evening. They got progressively greater, like boom, boom, boom. Neighbor Derek Lowen and his father running over to help, grabbing whatever they could. We kept running in and out as much as we could, so um, police officers told us that we could no longer go in because it was too dangerous. This isn't a new problem for this town. In 2004, a massive 160-foot sinkhole opened on the same road, shutting it down for nearly 10 months. But this new sinkhole, even larger, and officials say it could take even longer to fix. Authorities blaming it on a collapsed sewer pipe 45 feet under the ground. Residents being urged to stay away. A lot of these people get their jobs done. Now, a devastating situation. We don't want to become a trash. Engineers are now working to figure out a way to get some of these families back to their homes, but say that could take as much as two weeks. Dan Paula. Eva, thank you. I want to turn to a very so um it's maybe hopefully that came through pretty well I, I heard most of that there was also a very eerie 911 call that we got a recording of uh although the resident saying her house was cracking in the you know wee hours of the morning um it, it was an all hands on deck um the commissioner again like i said just took the bull by the horns and said you know what we can't have this can't have our residents uh, exposed to this we got to protect ourselves better um so that led to you know, the, the overall system study and then what we call a segment five uh, project. So the segment five project um, is basically addressing from that sinkhole, which is about uh, 7,000 feet from where we're at right now. I'm at the, actually at the site now, uh, 7,000 feet downstream of where this sinkhole occurred. So it's addressing all that to where it comes to uh, confluence with the, the other interceptor. So it's addressing all that the, this interceptor still has the debris from that sinkhole in it. So we've kind of been limping around with a, not a full capacity of our interceptor during that time. Um, and we've constructed what you see in this photo here. Um, we're constructing a pump station, which is about 95% done now, down at the downstream end of this arm, the Romeo arm interceptor. Um, it's uh, 65 feet deep. Uh, and then once we, once this thing is fully operational, we're going to go in and clean out all the debris from the sinkhole um, from the 2016 sinkhole. And then we're going to slip line this entire reach. So this is all in regards to like we do not want another sinkhole. So that led to this construction of the shaft. What One of the components, I don't want to overstep this, is we have a clay over sand and, and sands and silts that are surrounding the interceptor and it's got a high water level uh, water table that's you know if the, the interceptor gets a leak it pipes in that water we lose that confining pressure around the pipe and that leads to sinkholes and that's why the, this system's been plagued for so long so we knew early on hey we got to build this big uh, pump station it's going to be a lot of uh, dewatering and the dewatering is going to be critical that's probably what my next slide's about anyway, if you want to go to that one. So that's uh, where the soil slide is here. Um, we started, when they started, uh, we have a tiered earth retention system. We did a ribbon lagging upper. We're, we're right, I should note this as well, we're right on the ITC corridor. So we have major uh, electrical lines all over the top of our shaft. So we had to telescope our shaft down. And then we had to work through the, the upper clay into the sand. So we had to dewater early and it's been dewatered, an ongoing dewatering program for about two years at this point. And it's a, a 27 or 24 hour day, seven day a week uh, ordeal out here to, to make sure that we're keeping the water down, even to this moment. So, um, Jeff, I don't know, you want me to take this one and then you go into it or? Yeah, sure, why don't you take this one and then I'll go through the hardware. Yeah, so we, we've we done a lot of dewatering uh, designs and instrumentation through the years. We're a, a heavy geotech design uh, company. Um, we've used Geocon vibrating wire prismeters for a lot of our dewatering monitoring. So we knew we were gonna develop our monitoring system around the shaft. We had a, a series of uh, vibrating wires that were put in all the way around and we started uh, 
monitoring those, watching our drawdown. I think we had to pump for a couple months before we were even allowed to reach a certain depth with our excavation. Um, and we set it up to have a remote monitoring system so we could, you know, even when they're not working out here, it's typically a five or six day a week job. So uh, we want to make sure if there's problems on the weekends, because that tends to be when we have the problems that we, we're alerted right away, um, getting the, the emergency alerts um, and, and those associated things. So keeping everybody in the loop. Great, thanks, Zach. Um, so I'll go through the GeoNet hardware and the cloud data storage platform that was used to allow the project to have um, real-time data acquisition um, and data storage that would feed into the Inswa platform. So uh, starting off with the GeoNet hardware, um, the loggers are built using a modular architecture. So we start out with a base data logger board um, from there, we add a sensor card. So that sensor card could be a vibrating wire uh, readout. It could be um, an integrated MEMS tilt sensor, or it could be an RS-45 um, readout to allow addressable sensors. Uh, from there, we add a battery board that could be a rechargeable lithium ion battery or um, replaceable D cells. And then finally, we can add telemetry to, to these loggers. So, um, you can add radio uh, telemetry to communicate to a gateway or, uh, you know, directly to the network through cellular Wi-Fi or satellite telemetry. Uh, so this is in a nutshell what the, the product line looks like. So one, four, and eight channel vibrating wire loggers, uh, the digital logger tilt, and then uh, either cloud-based gateways or local gateways. And then you can mix and match telemetry options for all of these different products. And the data, regardless of telemetry option chosen, all goes into the same cloud and can be managed in the same uh, project. Um, so for this particular project, uh, mesh network was set up. Um, so this mesh network is a self-configuring mesh. So the nodes will hop and find the easiest path back to the gateway. And that gateway will communicate with uh, the cloud storage uh, system using a uh, cellular connection. Uh, this particular gateway was configured with uh, LTE um, modem. Uh, so depending on where you are in the world, uh, there's, there's different configurations. Uh, this runs on a, a small uh, solar panel, but can also be connected through mains power. And any cloud connected device can be uh, fully managed through the uh, Geocon cloud platform. So this is an example of uh, what the device management platform looks like. So this particular uh, project shows uh, two individual uh, loggers, one, um, with a satellite connection, one with a Wi-Fi connection, and then a gateway uh, showing 26 connected nodes. Uh, so this gives you basic information on the status, whether or not it's, it's active, when it's last connected, when it received data, and the type of data that it's sending. One step down, you can dig into the gateway and see the types of nodes that are connected, uh, whether or not there's any radio interruption in, in your network that requires um, you know, some, some field troubleshooting and repositioning of, of nodes uh, during commissioning. Uh, you can see here again, the type of logger and the type of data uh, that would be coming from each, each node. If we dig into the individual GeoNet uh, logger, this is where you can set things like read interval, power mode, and activate cellular service. Uh, this also gets into a little bit of diagnostic data to check battery life, um, the strength of the mesh signal. Uh, so this is very easy to change the read interval throughout the project. Um, with just a click of a button, you can change from you know, hourly to every 10 minutes. If you're coming up on a critical stage of the project, it's very easy to change that as the project requirements uh, dictate. 
And then this is where we connect to other platforms like Inzwa or any other third party data platform. So uh, the Geocon Cloud is simply a, a data storage platform. It allows you to configure the devices and really just aggregates the data and uh, also connects to the, uh, the calibration database. But we don't have uh, native visualization uh, capabilities within this platform. Um, so what we do here is uh, generate what's called an API token. And this allows us to set up secure access to project databases and share that uh, database with visualization software partners to um, you know, plot up the data in whatever format and whatever units they, they prefer. Um, so at this point, I'll pass it back to Zach to kind of talk about the, the systems that were, were used here to visualize data. All right, thanks, Jeff. So uh, this one, uh, the, the whole system went down. It, it 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 should have a little bit of background. I you know I I was talking to Mike. Where I was using some Enzwa instrumentations on another job, and he happened to be uh, in town. And he's and he came out to the segment five site, and he's like he was looking at the geocon system we have out there. And he's like, oh, you should let us uh, also show you what we can do on our platform at the same time. And I'm like, oh yeah, well you know. How much is it? <laughs> He's like, well, you can demonstrate it uh, on this job, um, so you can kind of learn and see see what it is. And I'm like, oh yeah, let's do it. Let's let's check it out. I'm always looking to learn something new. So we were running with with the you know two platforms basically uh, on this job. And as I mentioned earlier, as it always works out, you know, we were kind of at a critical spot with our lower uh, temporary earth retention excavation. Um, and it was a Saturday, and of course the remote system went down. Everybody that's on our text alert got an alert, so everybody's all hands on deck. You know, of course I think it was like Saturday morning, and uh, so we we're all kind of panicking. And, I'm, and it hit me. I'm like, oh, you, you know, let's let's you know let's check the Inzwa platform as well. Let's see what see what we got, and just just make sure maybe that everything's down. And I was able to still see our data on another platform it was a different type of failure so it wasn't uh it didn't take out everything for us and it, it was a complete utter relief i mean i didn't have to like call the owner and get the contractor out here we, we knew we had a, a something that we could troubleshoot but it didn't have to be done you know in the middle of a saturday which uh to me was a a godsend so then i think uh probably hand it off to to you then mike on that note yeah. Yep. Well, thank, thanks very much, uh, Zach. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Peruzzi. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, being part of uh, today's uh, webinar. Uh, in this section of the webinar, uh, we are going, going to uh, go into uh, FK Engineering's uh, instance uh, on, our, on our platform uh, so we can see uh, how uh, the Geocon devices are integrated uh, into the platform. Uh, and then we can also take a, a quick look at the data and some of the reporting uh, that uh, that they utilize um, uh, to to keep tabs uh, on on the project. Uh, but before we uh, get into that, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, uh, about Inswa Cloud. And uh, as as some of you may know, uh, Inswa got its start in the vibration monitoring world. Um, and in working in that world, uh, we learned quite a bit uh, about what um, what people were doing uh, to manage data. Uh, and they, they were doing many, many different things, uh, but a lot of people were doing things uh, manually, uh, taking data, uh, managing it in Excel, creating charts in Excel, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we felt uh, that there was a real opportunity here uh, to build a platform that simplified um, all of these uh, the data management tasks uh, that uh, the people were going through. And so uh, one of the things that we did uh, with uh, with Inswa Cloud uh, was we uh, made the system understand uh, data that was coming in. Uh, this and so this allows the system uh, to interpret the data and decide that this data is related to a vibrating wire device or a tilt sensor or whatever it might be, and it can automatically classify that data. Uh, and this uh, saves uh, the user from having to. Uh, 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 define what that is, uh, and then also do data mapping, uh, which a lot of people were doing, uh, were using uh, other types of third-party systems. 
We wanted to make it really simple uh, for users to be able to get data in and report on it right away. The, uh, the, the uh, screenshots that you're seeing here are screenshots of projects uh, that are displaying uh, tooltips uh, with data uh, in them. Uh, no configuration was required other than uploading the, the image uh, in order to be able to, uh, to view that data. Uh, uh, number two, please, Jeff. Now, of course, none of this is very useful if you can't support all of the, of the uh, manufacturers uh, that, uh, that play in the geotechnical space. And the InterCloud does, does just that. Uh, we support the manufacturers that you see here, plus many others. And we also support a, a, a large number of device types, uh, obviously vibration monitors, uh, tilt meters, uh, uh, sound level meters, vibrating wire, analog and digital sensors, uh, all can be supported on the system. And all are automatically recognized by the system and reportable uh, immediately. The third way that we simplify uh, things for users is, is through dashboards and an analytics. Uh, as I mentioned before, users uh, were often using things like Excel uh, to build uh, charts and graphs. Uh, people that were using more sophisticated systems were left building uh, out dashboards from scratch for every project that they, that they were doing. Uh, we took a little different approach and we decided to uh, build uh, default dashboards based off of the device type uh, that we're dealing with. And since we know that, uh, we can give a presentation uh, of data uh, automatically without having to build anything. And, and the, uh, the screenshots that you were just viewing are several examples uh, of, uh, of, our, of our device dashboards. And the fourth way, uh, that we make things more uh, simple for our users is through reporting. Uh, we've built a, a, a pretty robust uh, reporting engine uh, that can produce uh, reports uh, like the one you're seeing here, and we'll see one of Zach's reports uh, in, in a short bit. Uh, but this is all done through a templating system uh, where you can use templates that, uh, that exist already uh, in the system to output uh, the, the summary data from a project. And these reports can include uh, data from a whole number of sensors, any number of sensors that are on the project, and can summarize them in groups and categories uh, to, to make them easy to, to read for users. All right, so uh, next we're gonna jump over to the software demo. And so uh, I'm gonna take over the presentation uh, from Jeff. Okay, now I'm pretty sure that everyone can see this map. Um, so this is, uh, this is the home screen of our software platform. And I'm not gonna d dive into this just yet. I'm gonna take a little different path uh, than typically do. And I'm gonna go over to our, our device uh, management uh, area. And this is where all of the devices uh, that are automatically recognized by the system um, are, are managed. And you can see there's, uh, there's quite a list here. We've got a whole bunch of Geocon vibrating wire uh, devices defined. Now, these devices got in here uh, uh, through the API uh, that Jeff referred to a few minutes ago. Uh, and uh, all we had to do was add the API key that he talked about to the platform. Um, and the system can also manage multiple API keys um, if, if you uh, manage your, your devices through uh, multiple API keys in the, in the GeoNet uh, network. But once we have that API key, uh, the system is able to then discover all of the uh, nodes uh, and, and, and their sensors uh, that are associated uh, uh, with, it, with that API key, and it makes them available here uh, in this, uh, in this uh, device dashboard. Uh, and so one of the things that I really like about uh, the, the uh, GeoNet system uh, is that the fact that it provides engineering unit data uh, for you. Um, and so we uh, make that uh, available for selection in the device configuration. So here in uh, one specific device, if I go to settings, I have a couple of drop downs that allows me to select uh, what type of data uh, I'm interested in, in tracking the data for and what type of units uh, I'd like. All of, the, all of this information comes uh, from Geocon via the API. Uh, and these, is, these are the engineering unit uh, that they make available uh, through that API uh, to, uh, to InsoCloud. Um, 
And what one of the really nice benefits that I, that I like about it is that, that all of this uh, engineering unit data calculation is done uh, using uh, the calibration information that that uh, Geocon has on file for for your specific sensors. So you don't even have to enter you know coefficient values and things of that nature uh, when setting up uh, a, a sensor uh, using using this uh, platform. All right. So that's how the data gets integrated in. Uh, this is where people, uh, you know, configure and uh, uh, assign devices to a project. Uh, the typical life cycle of a device uh, in into a cloud uh, is that it starts in an unassigned uh, state, and you can see there are some devices here that are unassigned. They then get assigned to a project, and they live on that project for a period of time, and then they're unassigned from that project which makes them available to, to assign to the next project. And so they can continue to go through this cycle uh, of assignment and unassignment uh, throughout their, their life. So I'm gonna go jump back here to the home screen. Uh, so here's uh, on the home screen, we see all of the projects uh, that this particular user has access to. Um, and the project that we're interested in uh, is this 15 mile road project. And I can click on this, uh, get this tool tip, uh, which shows me some basic information about uh, that that project. And if I click on the title, I can then drill down uh, to the project itself. And so in this particular case, uh, this project is set up with uh, with a with a drawing uh, showing uh, the locations of the uh, uh, of the vibrating wire sensors uh, that have been uh, placed around the interceptor. Uh, and we and we place pins on this uh, drawing representing uh, each uh, each of the sensors. Now you notice that some pins are in red. Uh, I believe that those sensors are currently out of service, but the ones shown here in blue are, are currently in service. If I click on it, I can see the latest piece of information uh, that we have about that particular uh, sensor. By clicking on this, uh, uh, I get down to the, uh, uh, the device dashboard. This is the dashboard that we saw uh, previously. Uh, and so this, this particular device hasn't sent some data in a few uh, days. So I'm going to come in here and I'm going to change the time frame uh, so that we can see some data. And we can see the data here then charted on the screen. Uh, we have both uh, the, the, uh, the data in, in, in feet, the, you know, the water level in feet. We also have the temperature uh, that's provided uh, by, the, by the system. Uh, typical uh, uh, tools uh, here for uh, looking at the data and drilling down into it. Uh, you, you can, as, as you saw, uh, uh, select a, a time frame uh, that you want to view. Uh, you can also zoom in by just uh, clicking and dragging and zooming in on a specific section of data. Rolling over the data, you can see specific values. Double clicking brings you back out uh, to uh, to the top level. So. And then uh, below that uh, are the alarms uh, that are related to this, uh, this particular device. If I go back, I can then uh, access other sensors uh, that are on, uh, on this uh, particular project. So it makes it real easy to go through and review what's been going on on this particular project. The other thing that uh, I wanted to show you as part of this uh, demonstration is uh, one of the, uh, the reports uh, that's uh, generated for this uh, project. I'm gonna change my screen here and hopefully you've, you're now seeing uh, the, the title page of, of a report. This is a report that's generated uh, weekly. Um, I believe it's on a Saturday. Uh, it comes out automatically and is set, uh, sent to both uh, uh, the FKE engineers, as well as uh, the, the project stakeholders. Um, and this uh, particular uh, uh, report it uses a standard template so that we have in the system. So no configuration had to be done in order to, to generate this report. But the report starts, starts off with a, with a title page, you know, giving the basic uh, you know, parameters of this report. Uh, it has uh, a map showing the location uh, of uh, all, all the devices on this project. It has a device inventory table uh, showing all the devices that are currently on the project. Uh, it also has a, an aggregation table. Uh, in, this, in this case, uh, we're aggregating data uh, to show us the max uh, water level uh, uh, during this report period on, on each device. 
Um, our reporting system has a lot of capability in terms of generating aggregate uh, uh, data or aggregate tables, uh, all configurable uh, through, the, uh, through the template builder. And then after that, we have uh, histograms uh, for each device um, that's on the project. And in, in, the, in the template, this is just simply a definition of, I want all vibrating wire sensors uh, to, uh, to show a histogram, histogram data. A uh, user did not have to go in and configure each individual uh, sensor to appear on this report. Um, and so that's basically the, the, uh, the extent of this report um, is just uh, one, uh, one chart per, uh, per device. So that, uh, that concludes the, the discussion on the, the software. Um, I'm going to turn this back over to Jeff, I think. Um, yeah, thanks, Mike. So um, I think Joel was going to uh, tee up any questions that we had for the Q&A session. Yes. So first up, are plots in INSWA dashboards auto scale or can you manually adjust scales? Uh, <laughs> yes, you can. I'm sorry, I probably should have shown that. Uh, so they auto scale by default, uh, but uh, you can adjust the, the vertical scale to, to whatever mins and maxes you, you would like. Great. Next, is the data stored after the sensors are reassigned to a new project? So would they be available for future reference, for example, after 10 years? Uh, yes, they would. Yeah, so we, we, we uh, maintain uh, the, the data from uh, prior projects, uh, and you can go into an inactive project and get to the device dashboard and, and uh, view the data uh, from, that, uh, from that dashboard. Um, and you can also generate reports um, on, uh, on uh, 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 past projects. Excellent. What type of settlement monitoring was done? And that's probably, might be for me. I think so, that's for Zach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so we had a the geotechnical monitoring program that we had out here. Obviously, we had the vibrating wires for the groundwater drawdown. Um, we had a partner out here who's our surveyor. So we had control points. Uh, both on the timber earth retention system and on the final structure uh, on the towers. Like I said, we were in the ITC towers here. Um, so we have a, a lot of control points there. And we also have inclinometers that are uh, installed around the shaft and a couple because of the, the lower tiers, the lower timber earth retention system is a uh, soldier pile system. So we have some embedded right in there, right in the earth retention system themselves to monitor for movement. So it's a little, uh, you know, a couple different facets of instrumentation that we had to do out here. I would, I, you know, I didn't really say it in the introduction, but um, the particular site that we're on is a, a very, very busy site through the last 20 years. Not only is it where it's confluence of two interceptors into an, an even larger interceptor that goes down in the main treatment plant in Detroit, but it's, you know, there was a control structure built here in the early 2000s and uh it had a lot of trouble uh with some dewatering issues so the site had even a dewatering history so it even you know our, our ears were even extra perked up for this particular job so and it and again the site has had so much activity we slid this pump station between a couple old shafts that were out here so it's it's a dynamic site um let's see so uh was there any process required this one's for zach too on settlement was there any process required to mitigate any settlements that were occurring no we 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 have we established like action levels and things the to, to keep the contractor aware like we're seeing some kind of movements um uh so we had a protocol in place to where hey this is once we hit you know, I forget exactly what it is offhand, but a third of an inch, we're talking about it. You know, we're we're going to say what what's going on? Why do we see this? Why do we see that? Um, really, what has been used the most out here is if we had, I mean, we almost instantly know when a well gets clogged up and is not performing like it normally would be performing. I mean, we get an alert right away from the 
from our, our uh, vibrating wire brazometer and, and we're on it. I mean, I can almost text the, I'm sure he hates it, but I'll text him. I'm like, hey, the water wall three is not doing what it should be doing, man. What's going on? Oh, okay, yeah, they're coming out to check it out. I mean, that's been probably what has been most used out here. And again, it's been in place for at least two years at this point, I think. Excellent. Let's see. Was um, so does did the INSWA platform also support the survey and inclinometer data that was used on this project? No. No. Okay. No. Like I said, the active thing that we were monitoring, the only thing that we did remote monitoring for was the the dewatering. Everything else we, you know, we had a pretty active and robust monitoring system with the surveyors and a system set in place like, hey, if you see some movement. You got to let the resident engineer know and um, pretty active communication for everything else. Uh, but the dewatering one is that's the one that's, you know, dewatering system still running when you're nobody's here. You know, you leave for that Christmas vacation and I'm nervous. You know, was, there's certain times where a dewatering system goes down and, uh, you know, we're, we're in bad shape. We're getting closer to where we have a little bit of forgiveness because the pump station's in now, but um there was time where hey we don't have a bottom of this thing so we lose dewatering we have to know right now you know and that's that was the most critical stuff let's see we have one more here queued up is it possible to import manually taken data into the inswa platform uh yes it is uh possible to bring uh manually uh uh, taken data into the platform. Uh, the best approach to do that kind of depends on, you know, the type of data and how much data uh, there is that needs to be imported. Uh, but yeah, it is uh, certainly possible to do that. Excellent. Uh, we just had another question come through. We'll do one more and then uh, we'll be, we'll end the Q&A session. So the last question that came through was, how were the sinkholes filled? And do you have any idea how much material was used? <laughs> yeah, so um, how much material's in here? Oh, hey, Nick, what's our estimate for how much material's in the pipe still? 6,000 tons. 6, tons from the 2016 sinkhole. And that stuff's still in a pipe. So when you walk this 11 foot diameter pipe right now, it's kind of it's kind of like a beach sand walk because it's all sand and silts that got blown into the tunnel so there's two and a half to three feet of sand so if you can imagine yourself on a nice beach but it's not a beach um it's it's you know you got knee deep uh sewage you're walking through but um so six six thousand tons that's from the that just that sinkhole because the the old four sinkhole they actually um vacuumed out all the material that got blown in from that one. Um, the sinkholes that have happened over the years, um, like I said, there's three on the Romeo arm and they they are nose to, to head with each other. They can link up like, you know, wagon blocks, you know, it's just like, it's, it, it you know, nothing has been done for long-term fix and that's what we've been working on now. So this is like, you know, stop stop putting band-aids on this stuff. Uh, like I said, the uh, 2000 sinkhole was 65, 70 million dollars to fix a football field of interceptor. That's you know, you, you know, you can't sustain that kind of expenditure. So much more could be done with that kind of money if you're planning things out. Anything done on an emergency basis is counterproductive. Great. All right. So we will call that the end of our q a we've had this slide up for a minute here if uh, anybody was interested you could use these qr codes to connect with us on linkedin um, a link to this webinar recording will be sent out via email and will be available for viewing anytime on geocon's website or the inswa blog after today. So just to close things out, we'll thank you again for joining us today. It's been a pleasure reviewing this case study with you, and we hope that you have a good afternoon or evening, wherever you may be. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.